Hello and welcome to Ask a Scientist Live. I'm Alison Green, Executive Director of Scientists Warning Foundation, a non-profit dedicated to bringing people together to unite behind the science to set out scientist warnings papers. So I'm your chair for this Ask a Scientist Live event brought to you by the wonderful Extinction Rebellion scientists. And our panel will be taking your questions on the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill, scientifically robust yet politically radical. Now the event will work like this. Our team will scan your questions as they come in. So you can submit a question via Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube. Please give us your name and tell us where you are. A city will be absolutely fine. Now we have some problems. We have a government that failed to take the necessary action in time when the first wave of coronavirus swept across the country and is failing again to take the necessary action as a second wave is almost upon us people will die unnecessarily. Citing the Committee on Climate Change report in July last year, Dr. Amy McDonnell, a founder of the CEE Alliance, said the government is no way near to implementing the massive changes needed to meet its own targets. The report found that ministers had delivered on only one of 25 policy actions identified by the 2018 Committee on Climate Change as being necessary to get the UK back on track to reach its targets. The Chief Executive of the Committee on Climate Change, Chris Stark, said at the time that policy just isn't happening, hasn't kept pace with the new desire for climate action. And then recently Boris Johnson pledged that 30% of the UK's land will be protected for the recovery of nature by 2030, which sounds amazing until you discover that he considers that 26% of our land is already used for this purpose. We're caught up in a vicious cycle of delayism, cynicism and compromise that assures us of one thing and that is failure. The CEE bill if passed would represent one of the most significant legislative acts since the Climate Change Act of 20, 2008, which was itself a private member's bill. Okay, so while you are thinking about some questions that you'd like to put to our panel this evening, I'd like to do a quick round of introductions around our amazing panel, starting with Dr. Charlie Gardner. Thanks, Alison. Um, my name's Charlie. I'm a conservationist, a wildlife conservationist. So I lecture in conservation science at the Durrell Institute of Conservation and Ecology at the University of Kent. And while we do amazing things as conservationists, we, we, can, we know how to um, save endangered species and we know how to um, conserve threatened forests. For a long time, I felt that this wasn't enough. Conservation is not enough because we're not addressing the drivers of climate change and the drivers of um, environmental destruction. So for the last two years, I've been involved with XR scientists and through that, I was asked to contribute to drafting the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill. So I've had some role in drafting it, and now I'm helping to campaign and build a broad alliance for this bill. Wonderful. Thank you, Charlie. Now, moving on to Charles Secret. Charles, would you like to introduce yourself? was on mute. Uh, hi everybody. Well obviously I'm delighted to be here. My name is Charles Secret. I live in Brighton which is where I'm from in the south coast of England. I've been involved with uh, XR for a couple of years um, but most particularly over the last year in the uh, Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill Alliance. Um, I've been uh, responsible for helping to draft the bill like Charlie. Uh, but also for developing the organizational strategy, uh, which is based on a campaign model that I hope to talk more about uh, later on uh, this evening. Uh, as a campaign model that works and that gives hope to everybody. Super, thank you, Charles. Moving on now to Caroline Egan. Hi, I'm Caroline Egan. I'm based in Dorridge, which is a, a village in the, in the Midlands. Uh, earlier this year, I retired after just short of 40 years working as a commercial solicitor, drafting and negotiating contracts and interpreting legislation. And what I was always looking to do in that work was to make the terms clear 
so that there wasn't wiggle room, it, that, that you knew exactly what you were committing to and that they were tied into timelines. And that's what I was looking to um, help to, to bring to the, to the table when quite late in the uh, drafting process, I was brought in to help on that. And, and now I'm very happy to be also working on promoting the bill. Wonderful, thank you, Caroline. And our, the fourth member of our panel is Yuri Rogel. Yuri, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, I am uh, Yuri Rogel. I'm a climate scientist at Imperial College in London. Uh, my research really focuses on uh, climate change mitigation and deep decarbonization pathways. Um, in my role as a scientist, I have uh, contributed to reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, where we look at all the scientific evidence and we try to distill from that our best available scientific knowledge. And I hope that I can also contribute this to, to this conversation today. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate. Wonderful, thank you. So we have a super panel here with us today. Now, before we start moving into taking your questions, um, I'd like to ask Charlie Gardner to give us a very quick run through of the, the CEE bill. Charlie? Thanks, Alison. Um, so this, the CEE bill um, looks complex if you look at it because it's written in a particular language, but actually it's very simple. And it contains three main components. So the first is to do with climate and um, about emissions reduction. So it obliges the UK government to um, reduce greenhouse gas emissions at a rate that would allow us to um, limit global heating to 1.5 degrees. The second part is about the ecological crisis and it obliges the UK government to protect and restore our ecosystems here in the UK um, for multiple reasons, to help conserve biodiversity, but also because those ecosystems are a fantastically important store of carbon. So that also contributes to fighting climate change. The great thing about both these components is it makes us take responsibility, not just for the impacts that we cause um, here within our national territory, but the impacts that um, are caused by our consumption of things produced abroad. So if we import things produced in factories abroad or import agricultural commodities that cause deforestation abroad, then we have to take responsibility for that rather than you, um, seeing it as someone else's problem. And then the third thing is that the bill doesn't actually contain policy prescriptions. It doesn't say what we have to do to meet these targets. It leaves that up to um, the citizens of this country. And we're promoting a form of deliberative democracy called um, citizens assemblies. So the idea is that this, the bill sets, um, tells us what we have to achieve, but it doesn't tell us how to get there. We don't believe that politicians are the right people to tell us how to get there. We don't believe that environmentalists are the right people to tell us how to get there either. Instead, we think this should be um, a truly democratic decision using citizens' assemblies. So, so that's the bill in a nutshell. Wonderful. Thank you, Charlie, for that amazingly quick and succinct summary of the bill. Right, so we're going to start the question and answer session now. And the first question was sent in advance to us by Alex from London. And this is a question for Yuri. Now, the question is, a lot of MPs are answering people who are writing to them and saying that the UK government is doing enough to reach its own targets, net zero in 2050. But is that really the case? Yeah, thank you for that question. I think... Um... Thank you also for starting off with this question, which is probably the easiest to answer. Um, Alison, you already uh, ex actually explained in your introduction, the Committee on Climate Change, so the government's official own watchdog for how it is doing on climate change in its latest report highlighted that the government and that the current policies that the government is implementing is not enough to reach the goals and the carbon budgets that the government has set itself. Now, these carbon budgets were even not yet in line with the more stringent long-term goal that it, at, that it has set itself, the net zero 20 greenhouse gas goal uh, in 2050. So it is absolutely clear that at present, uh, government sources themselves, the Committee on Climate Change themselves, highlights that the government is not doing enough to reach its own goals. Thank you, 
Thank you. And I think that's made very, very clear in the recommendations of the Committee on Climate Change recently, which which horrified me in that they they stated that they we should prepare for up to four degrees of warming by 2100, which they that, which they have previously conceded as being dangerous, which I find absolutely horrifying. Um, OK, um, would anyone else like to come in on in on that question and augment the answer or should I move on to the next question? OK, OK, thank you. So the next question then is for Charlie. Um, now, this question um, sent in advance from Scott, one of our XR scientists. And the question is, do we need a bill that covers both the climate and ecology? I, I really think that it is essential that we address both these crises at the same time because they're two sides of the same coin and there are a lot of synergies that could be uh, yeah, be between the two. So we, we can't hope to avoid the worst of climate change unless we conserve our ecosystems because these are a huge store of carbon. Things like forests and wetlands and peat bogs um, store lots of carbon, which would be released if we um, destroyed these ecosystems, but which also allows us to absorb lots of carbon from the atmosphere if we restore them. We also can't conserve biodiversity. We can't conserve our ecosystems successfully if we don't address climate change because everything's going to change if we don't address climate change. And then, yeah, we simply won't have functioning forests and things in, in, in this country. So, so absolutely they need to be addressed in the same time. But also it's important um, because if we address them in isolation, there's a risk that um, focusing on one can have negative impacts on the other. For example, one of the emergency climate actions that we often hear about is tree planting, planting lots of trees. But if we, if we don't do that um, cleverly, if we don't do that towards these <coughs> twin objectives at the same time, planting the wrong trees in the wrong place could be devastating for wildlife. If you plant, um, you know, non-native trees in a fenland, then you've destroyed that fenland, which is in itself a valuable habitat for biodiversity. So I think to avoid risks of having you know, our action towards one crisis negatively impacting the other, it's really important that we address both in synergy. And for, for very many reasons, joined up policy is, is always a good idea in policy making. Thank you. Okay. Um, anyone want to come in and supplement that response? Okay, I'm moving on then. We, luckily, we have a lot of questions. So anyone who's just joined, this is Ask a Scientist Live. We're debating the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill. I'm Alison Green. I'm joined by a panel of four experts in this area, including people who had a role in drafting the bill. Okay, so moving on now. The next question then is for Caroline. Caroline, what, and this one comes from um, Cara, Rosent and Cara, um, XR engineers, engineers, sorry. Okay, what, if anything, does the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill have to offer, which the UK's Environment Bill doesn't? Uh, well, thank you for that question, Cara. Um, it's a bit of a case of how long have you got? <laughs> um, the, but, but in a nutshell, and this follows on from what Charlie was saying, the Environment Bill is very, very limited in its scope and in its ambition and doesn't tie at all together the interlocking elements of climate change, the ecology and biodiversity. Whereas, as Charlie has explained, the CEE Bill has that at its heart. And even were that not the case, the Environment Bill unfortunately has a large number of holes in it. And um, just to give you an example of, of four of them, um, it only imposes two obligations on the Secretary of State. One is to come up with long-term targets, just he only has to come up with one target in relation to each of, of four areas, which are air quality, water, uh, biodiversity, and waste uh, resources and, and waste. Um, and 
that has to be for at least 15 years, but there are no binding interim targets. And those targets themselves could be very small and discrete targets. The other obligation on him is to come up with what's called an environmental improvement plan, but that is very vaguely drawn. It has to have the effect of a, quote, significant improvement in the natural environment, but again, no definitions there. Also, the timeframes are just way too slow. Um, the Secretary of State doesn't even have to come up with the draft targets um, until October 2022, and doesn't have to come up with a draft environmental improvement plan until uh, January 2023. And critically, there is no promise in the bill that we, there will not be any regression from the protections that we currently have under European law and which will disappear at the end of the year. And finally, enforcement. Um, any bill is only as good as the enforcement powers that there are for it. Um, so as we're losing the right to go to the European court, there is a new office for environmental protection, but there are significant issues over its independence, its funding, and critically, its lack of teeth. Um, so hopefully that, that's given you a flavour for, for why the Environment Bill isn't sufficient. Thank you, Caroline. It's staggering, isn't it? There's so much wiggle room in it. And, and what strikes me is that if, we were, if this was a, were an academic institution or a business, it's just unthinkable that, 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 you, know, that you, would, you would have so, so much wiggle room and so much room to manoeuvre. Yeah, I mean, if I were drafting a contract and I'd given the other side that much wiggle room, I'd, I'd be um, mortified. Thank you. OK. And, and you've, you've made the point incredibly well, um, which really gives us a sense of why we need this bill, because the current legislation just doesn't have sufficient teeth. You know, it's, it's, we're, we're unable to hold government to account. OK, um, moving on now to Charles. So we have a question here from Rachel from XR Bristol. And her question is, how can a private member's bill work? My MP says that while her party support many of the aims of the CEE bill, it's unlikely to be debated and she doesn't sign EDMs. Do you have any advice for a reply? And perhaps you could just explain what an EDM is to people like me, like me who don't really know too much about the parliamentary procedure and process. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, well, obviously another great question. Let's just deal with EDM first. Uh, before we go on to wiggle room and how we uh, avoid being trapped by it, or rather trap the politicians in their own wiggling. Uh, an EDM is called is an early day motion. Uh, and an early day motion is a petition in Parliament that MPs of all parties can sign. Though traditionally, uh, Conservatives tend not to, and ministers tend not to. But it's still a very important way of constituents going to their MPs and saying, look, this is a very important issue for us. As our elected representative, we want you to sign this EDM to show your support for the bill uh, or parliamentary measure in question. So wiggle room and uh, private members bills. Well, the type of response that um, our colleague in Bristol has had is typical of the first response from an MP when they're being asked to support a private member's initiative. They try and pretend that, well, this bill's not gonna go anywhere. Um, that we support the principles of the bill, but um, that's as far as it goes because there's not gonna be any time given in parliament by the government for it. It's a standard reply you get at the beginning of all these campaigns. And the type of campaign model that this bill is based on of citizen action, of constituency uh, demands of their MPs to support a measure aligned to building broad and deep alliances across a whole range of interest groups is exactly what the type of democratic pressure that does persuade Parliament to pass a bill just like this. And there are many examples in recent history where private members bill have become law as a result of this campaign, but there's some of this type of campaign. So 
the, 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 the key thing is don't give up, keep going. And those of us who work on the bill nationally, we've got all sorts of um, information uh, and uh, arguments and evidence that we can give you at the local level to help you deal with replies like this. There's something else that I want to add though as well, which is, is not just a question of getting the bill passed into law, critical though that is. There's also a intergovernmental process of climate and, and biodiversity summits that go on year on year. And at the moment, the UK is due to be the co-host of the next conference of parties for the climate change convention. And the UK is currently, that conference of parties going to be in November next year. And the UK is currently deciding what its position as co-host is going to be. So while we're asking MPs and Lords to, to support the bill, we're also asking them and we want constituents and voters to ask their MPs to say, all right, will you push the government to take the clauses of the bill into its negotiating position around COP26? And similarly, to do so for the Biodiversity sum Summit, which is going to be held in May uh, next year. So there are other very important parts of the bill that the MP can support in different ways while we continue the campaign to get the bill passed into law. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. And that, that message is so important because of course, MPs will simply back people back, it's what they do. Don't be deterred, this bill is so, so important. It's so important that you understand it. It's so important that you can advocate for it um, and tell your friends, tell your family as well. Thank you, Charles. Um, okay, I'm going to come loop back round to Yuri now with a question um, from my scientist warning colleagues, I think. Um, so this is a, a, a science question. What is needed globally for us to stay below 1.5 degrees C? And what is the UK's fair and proper share of that? Yeah, no, thank you for your question. Um, also, I'm happy to answer it. Um, first of all, what is needed globally? Um, let's start where we are today. Um, today, we have seen 1.1 degrees of global warming. We're um, warming the planet at roughly 0.2 degrees per decade. So every 10 years we add 0.2 to it and, and that's currently still slightly increasing. Uh, so that really means uh, we are not that far from 1.5. Um, to halt global warming, just to stop it, uh, we need to stop putting more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The total amount of cumulative emissions, the carbon budget is limited. Um, so we, and the only way of stopping uh, to put more emissions into the atmosphere is by bringing global emissions down to net zero. Um, that is true for any temperature level. That is true for 1.5, that is true for two degrees, that's even too, true for three degrees. If you want to stop warming at three degrees, global emissions have to go to net zero. Now for 1.5, because we are so close, the amount of emissions that we can still emit is really, is really small. And basically, in the assessment that we did in 2018 with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we found that if we ramp emissions rapidly down towards net zero by 2050, we have roughly a 50% chance of <clears throat> limiting warming to 1.5. What does that mean? That means that our best estimate is that we would end up at 1.5. In one out of two cases, we would end up below 1.5, but in one out of two cases, despite having done that really stringent ramp down towards zero carbon dioxide emissions globally in 2050, we end up with more warming. We don't end up with two or three degrees of, or two and a half or three degrees of warming, but we might end up with 1.7 degrees of warming or 1.8 degrees of warming. Still at that point, we have stopped warming at, the, at those 1.8 degrees which is much better than uh, being cruising through all those temperature levels towards higher levels by the end of the century. So if a 50% chance is acceptable, um, then 
net zero by 2050 is what you should be aiming for. And, and that also implies that you go down from today's levels immediately. Um, if you want a higher probability, you have to go down faster and get to net zero earlier. Um, if, you, if, you're allowed, if, if you're happy to take higher risks, and that is not a scientific question, it is really up to voters and, and, and the public and citizens to decide that, then, then later might still be okay. So that's what the science says uh, about the global level. And that is really easy because that is physics and uh, chemistry and physics. Now, what the UK has to do within that global envelope is, is, is a harder question. Um, that depends on, on ethics, on equity, on fairness. Uh, depending on what the UK does, other countries have to do either more or less. And um, there is a large literature about this, about uh, the, the fairness and the equity debate, climate equity debate. And there are key principles that are being used here. For example, whether a country has contributed a lot to global warming in the past through its historical emissions, whether it is developed or it's still developing. Um, whether it's um, uh, how much it is currently emitting um, and so on. And all these ethical principles are not principles where we as a scientist can say what is right or wrong, but once those principles have been defined, we can quantify what they mean for a country. And generally that means that a, uh, a developed country uh, has to do more than developing countries and needs to go to zero or, or implement emission reductions much faster than the global average. So in that sense, um, I cannot give you a, con uh, uh, a very concrete number for, um, for the UK because that depends on what you think is fair. Uh, but in most cases, fair means doing more than the global average. Thank you. I wonder, Thank could you. I add something to that? Of course, Charles. Because I think this is a really important uh, thing that you've just said, which is that the government's own scientific advisors say that the government's current target of net zero by 2050 gives us a 50-50 chance of avoiding disaster. That's a toss of the coin. Are we really going to gamble our futures, our kids' futures, our grandchildren's futures on the toss of a coin? I'm not prepared to do that. And that's why this bill is so important. This bill is about putting in place a law which says what the UK has to do to help avert disaster. And so that becomes a statutory obligation to protect nature, to stabilize the climate and to do so in a fair and just way. That's why this bill is so important. Thank you, Charles. Um, and Charlie wants to come in here as well. Charlie? Yeah, I'd like to add something to that too. I, of course, I fully agree that you know, the UK has to move fast and move early on the principle of fairness. But I also think that there's a strategic element here. But as Yuri pointed out, we will not be able to stabilise um, you know, planetary heating until we reach net zero emissions globally. In other words, this transition is coming, um, you know, whether we like it or not. The whole world is transitioning to zero carbon. Now, it strikes me that there's a huge advantage in moving early here. Whoever, whoever starts doing this, makes the investments up front, is suddenly the world is their oyster because they've moved fast. And it's a huge, in a way, it's a huge opportunity. We don't want to be playing catch up here as the rest of the world moves forward. Let's be in the lead um, and take advantage of, of everything that being first brings. Very good point. Thank you. Um, I, I, I have a, a comment and in a sense is a, a question I'd like to put to Yuri actually. But my, my sense is in listening to the scientists like, like, like yourselves, um, like Michael Mann, like Stefan Ramstorff, that um, that we have to achieve year on year reductions in emissions. And that because we are missing our targets, we're actually creating a bigger mountain for ourselves to climb in that the year on year reductions in emissions that we have to achieve are actually increasing. Is that, is that a fair comment? Yeah, that is, that is absolutely a fair comment. Um, I mean, imagine it as a, 
again, I think the, the idea of a carbon budget is, is, is really easy here. Um, the amount of carbon that we can emit if we want to limit warming to 1.5, for example, stays the same. Um, the slower we, or the more time we take to actually ramp our emissions down, the mm -hmm. steeper we have to go down. So with, um, with each year passing, basically the net zero time date comes two years closer. And, um, and that is, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's just uh, simple mathematics and a simple, simple consequence of delay uh, and of delaying action. That's absolutely right. Yeah, so, and of course, uh, the, yeah, the public ordinary people aren't, aren't actually seeing the consequences of that at the moment. Um, although in some places, arguably they are. So for example, we saw the horrendous wildfires in Australia, um, California, Oregon have just experienced much the same. And of course these are, and you know, incidents of flooding in the UK, which are only going to get worse. Um, so yes, I mean, the, the, the urgency is, is absolutely there. Okay, um, Charlie. Sorry to butt, to butt in again, but just very quickly, talking about this urgency and why it is such an emergency now. You know, um, climate scientists like Yuri aren't saying these things for the first time now. They've been saying them for 30 years. And politicians have not acted. We've not taken the required action, which is why it is an emergency now. And we have to cut these things so quickly now. Had we started taking the action 30 years ago, we would, of course, be halfway there by now. And it, the job would be much, much simpler. So I think it's thinking, looking back on, on our inactivity up till now highlights um, you know, just how important it is to, to, to take what action we can as quick as we can. I think that's a, it's an extremely good point. Um, and it's not at all helped by governments who, who tend to fall into that mode of trying to demonstrate that they're doing well, which is a kind of corporate mindset. Um, which is dishonest. It's simply, you know, they're being evasive um, and, and cynical. Okay, um, same with you, Charlie. The next question is in fact for you. Um, so I'm looking into um, the, the notion of deliberative democracy and citizens assemblies. And this question has been sent in by Esther from XR Romsey, who says that there's already a citizens assembly on climate convened by parliamentary committee. So how is the citizens' assembly proposed by the CEE bill to be different? Um, I, I think the, um, the, the climate assembly was um, a great thing because it showed us the power of this form of deliberative democracy. But there were certain um, big loopholes with it. One is that they were, you know, as far as I'm concerned and as far as um, you, you know, a lot of people were concerned, they were debating on the wrong premise. So the premise they were given is, how are we going to reach zero carbon by um, 2050? As Yuri has pointed out, that only gives us a 50% chance. And, you know, that's not good enough. Um, so, yeah, I strongly feel they were debating on, the, on the, the wrong premise from the start. It's also the case that they were only addressing climate issues. They weren't addressing the ecological emergency. And as I hope I, I made a case for earlier, these things really do have to be um, uh, you know, addressed in synergy. Um, the other thing is that the outcomes, the decisions made by the, um, the, the People's Climate Assembly um, have no power. So whereas the the citizens' assembly that will be instigated when the climate and ecological emergency bill um, makes law will be um, will be imbued with more power, so that the decisions they make um, actually get translated into policy. Thank you. Anyone else want to come in on that one? Because it's such a big thing, isn't it? Citizens' assemblies are really they're new to people in the UK. So, you know, and obviously people have reactions because they're new, which, you know, which might be to be slightly skeptical of them, slightly suspicious. Any any other comments from people on? Yeah, Charles. I think one of the things that we've got used to in this country is what's called representative democracy, where people vote every five years um, and then MPs uh, decide what's best for us all. But if we've learned anything over the last two or three decades is that government left to itself is not very good at making decisions that are good for all of us. 
And Citizens Assembly are a proven record. They've been used in other countries very effectively so that a representative section of the population can help policymakers come to better decisions. And this is what we call participative democracy. It's not just sloughing off responsibility to our MPs to you know, do everything for us. It's actually getting actively involved. And the whole campaign model that the bill is based on is uh, predicated on exactly that, of involvement and of working in community with community to hold, if you like, the feet of the reluctant MP to the fire okay. so that they actually begin taking sensible decisions that work for everyone's common good. And I think it's a fantastic uh, development that's happening to enliven our democracy. And that's a good point. I mean, some some might actually go further and say that governments, because of the, you know, because they're hamstrung by conflicting interests, by corporate interests, um, that they're unable to address these questions, that they can't, that they're simply unable to address the climate and ecological emergency. And that's that's why we're in this mess. And if that's the case, then it seems to me fairly clear that we we have to look to alternative solutions such as deliberative democracy. Okay, uh, right, Caroline, moving on now. So a question for you, and this is sent in advance by Caroline, an XR scientist. What, what power does the bill give us to hold government accountable? And so earlier you spoke about the wriggle room and, you know, and of course we've seen with the, with the present government that, you know, it's shameful to consistently keep missing the majority of their own targets and yet to not be held accountable. So what power will the bill give us to, to actually hold the government to account? Well, what, uh, what the bill does is set out specific obligations, um, in some cases on the prime minister, but and in a lot of cases on the Secretary of State for the Environment. And if they do not comply with those obligations, then they are breaching the law. And so the remedy for that is to um, go for what's called judicial review, where you go to the courts and the courts determine whether the government is complying with the law. And if it isn't, requires it to do so. And a recent example would be um, the halting on the expansion of Heathrow, where uh, it went to the courts and the Court of Appeals said, uh, actually, the minister didn't take in account, into account the government's obligations under the Climate Change Act. So that decision was needs to be re-looked at. Um, so you can you, we can go for judicial review. The only qualifier I'd say on that is that the government has started a, a review of judicial review, oh. um, which may end up with um, watering down that that right. Um, then then there's a sort of second level in that the the bill contemplates that the committee on climate change will be involved in. Um, setting out the metrics for deciding how we how we work out what we've got to do and if once those are set then again there's failure then there is the opportunity to go via judicial review for, on that as well thank you okay okay um anyone else want to come in with a comment on that particular question okay Right, um, Charles, so you have a lot of experience of campaigning of the parliamentary process. Um, now this question has come in, this is a compilation from a number of questions that were sent in advance. Um, how do we build cross party support? And do you think we can get it while we have a conservative majority government? Yeah, I mean, again, great question. Um, it's, uh, we'll only know the answer when we've done all that we can. Um, but let's take some comfort from recent history. 
many of the private members bills that um, I've referred to generally uh, that have subsequently become law, of which the last was um, the Climate Change Act itself, um, were originally opposed vehemently by the government of the day and basically ignored by an indifferent or otherwise busy parliament. Um, and I've been involved in campaigns uh, uh, like for uh, the Home Energy, uh, uh, the Warm Homes and Energy Conservation Act, just to name one, uh, or the um, uh, Countryside and uh, Access Act of 2000, where the government of the day had a parliamentary majority of 156 and was saying, no way are we going to pass these, which started off as private members' bills, we're going to pass these as law. And in this and in many other cases, which I can give chapter and verse after this Zoom call to anyone who writes in, we have been able through this type of campaign to overturn those government majorities, much larger than the one that the current government has. I think the problem with this government is that they're so duplicitous. And as we see, just from reading the papers every day, they say one thing and they do something completely the opposite. But I still believe that in our democracy and the ability of citizens to hold our MPs to account and to begin the process, opposition party by opposition party, to put the pressure on government to do the right thing. Because we know this makes sense. We know it's the only way out of the mess that we're in. And one of the most important things to do, and I say this to everyone out there who's listening in or watching, is united we stand. The campaigns that have been won in the past like this are not just about individual voters writing to their MPs or phoning them up or attending surgeries, you know, when you're allowed to do so, but about building unstoppable alliances of common interests. And I don't just mean amongst the obvious allies like the campaigning NGOs, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, or the charities like WWF or RSPB, and they're critical to bring on board and their local chapters, but also the Federation of Small Businesses, um, local authorities and local councils. We already know of 220 who have signed resolutions that are uh, tougher than the government's net zero by 2050. Um, unions, um, all these groups, churches, faith groups, they all have local branches or local associations. And part of the bill campaign is to uh, build alliances at that local level, because this is the sort of constituency pressure that MPs just are not used to dealing with. And the most powerful political force of all, especially with conservatives, is the Women's Institute <laughs> and the Towns Women's Guild. The, historically, they have always joined in these types of private member bills campaign. It's in their DNA. And so what I urge everyone to do, go out, build bridges, have meetings by Zoom or whatever with these other local associations and show them how it's in their interests and their organization's interest to join in. And once we do that, I can assure you, it doesn't matter whether it is a conservative majority, a labor majority or a coalition government, this bill makes so much sense that they'll pass it into law. And that's what we have to do. It's full of hope, this campaign, and lots of very useful precedent. Thank you. And, and as you were talking, I was reminded um, when you commented on the duplicitous duplicity of the Conservative Party or Conservative government. Um, so with the coronavirus pandemic, you know, they insisted from the outset that yes, they were listening to the science, they were being science led. It was actually the people who led on the policy making with coronavirus. That's what we have to do here. And this is what I like about this bill because it's, it's, it's people saying, yes, the government are failing to meet their targets. Do we believe that they're going to meet their targets? No, of course we don't. So hence, we need to have something that, that, that does have some teeth where we can hold them to account. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Charles. You put it incredibly well. Um, going back to the science now, and I'm coming back to Yuri, um, and I think also Charlie on this one. Um, now, we've heard a lot about concerns about negative emissions technologies, and 
you know, people who are listening to this will be fairly well versed in this, I'm sure. But this is the sense that, yes, we can keep on emitting carbon today because we can always draw it down tomorrow. Um, now, these technologies, particularly bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, which is also known as BEX, um, does, does the bill prevent them? And should we have any provision for technologies that are not yet proven at scale? So, Yuri, if we could start with you, please. Yeah, I can, I can maybe um, talk to what, uh, what we know about those technologies and what, and what risks they entail. And then maybe Charlie can take up of, of what the bill says about them and, and, uh, and how it tries to prevent those. So, um, let, first of all, let's, let's look at the lay of the land. Um, currently, there is no, um, no pathway no scenario available in, in the scientific literature um, or even in the what we call gray literature that limits warming and gets to zero emissions without relying on carbon dioxide removal. Carbon dioxide removal is a slightly larger term. There are ways to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through natural ways. For example, uh, afforestation um, or ecosystem restoration. And then there are the technology, technological ways, which are the negative emission technologies. So each pathway that is available uses at least some of, of these. Um, now, the pathways that are able to do so without any negative emission technologies or without any BECs are pathways with extreme assumptions on behavioral change and on demand response. Um, so we know that if we want to do without any of those uh, negative emissions technologies, without BECs, we need to achieve globally extreme changes in, in behavior and in, in energy demand uh, virtually overnight so that by 2050, we can uh, squeeze out the remaining carbon so much that afforestation and, um, and, and ecosystem restoration can can compensate uh, the, the rest. So what the evidence tells us is that we will, if we want to get to net zero, uh, given what we know about societal transformation, uh, we will at least, at least need some degree of nets. Now, these nets or negative emission technologies, they don't come without risks. They have been well described uh, and we know about them. For example, um, the, a, a the bad application of, of bioenergy or, or, or a, a bad rollout of, of bioenergy can lead, to food, uh, can lead to food security concerns, can lead to land grabs, can lead to deforestation that then is reforested or turned into agricultural land for, uh, for bio crop production. So there are lots of potential trade-offs. Um, what we also know is that best practices can avoid those trade-offs. Some of those best practices are uh, by basically growing bioenergy on abandoned agricultural land or by uh, growing bio crops on marginal lands where that, that are not rich in biodiversity and so on. So we know that these are that there are risks and trade-offs. And so it is clear from a scientific point of view that, uh, that these risks and trade-offs clearly need to be managed. And maybe here is a good point to hand over to Charlie to see how the bill tries to achieve this. Thanks, Yuri. So the bill, um, the bill states that the government can't rely on these negative emissions technologies to reach um, net zero in the um, through energy production. Instead, what it says is that we can use natural climate solutions. So we can, we we of course do need to not just stop emitting greenhouse gases, but we also have to absorb some of those that are already out there in the atmosphere because there's too much. Um, but we don't need to rely on unproven and um, in some cases dangerous technologies because we can do so through the management of our land. We can manage our soils in such a way that they can absorb um, greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere we can protect our existing forests, we can restore our, our wetlands. So the bill does make provisions to allow for um, 
carbon capture, but through natural climate solutions rather than these magical ones. And, but for me, the big problem with a reliance on negative emissions technologies is that they, they are often used by um, policymakers and governments um, as an excuse to allow them to carry on emitting. So the idea is, okay, we, we don't need to reach um, zero emissions now because we can just suck it up later. But to me, this is just the most ridiculous thing. If your bath is overflowing, you don't invest in some technology that's going to soak up the excess water from your floor in the future. You turn off the tap. The first thing you do is you turn off the tap. And that is what we have to do in all, you know, all climate legislation. We have to stop emitting greenhouse gases by stopping burning fossil fuels. And there's no getting away from that. So you know, the idea of, of some technology that will allow us to continue emitting in this way is, is a very dangerous idea. Absolutely, I totally agree. And I think there's a very good illustration. And this is the, the, the Tom Crowther study where, which, which suggested that if we planted a trillion trees, then that would take us some way towards solving the problem. And, and in principle, it sounds like a very appealing idea. And of course, growing trees is a very natural thing to do. But my understanding is that the scientific analysis of, of, of that research suggested that, as you can imagine, um, the, the, it's not as simple as that. That you know there are there are certain places where you cannot grow trees. Um, you know, it's identification of the land where the trees could be grown, and then adjusting the type of trees you would plant to the the changing climate. Um, so I think the the crux of it is that, that there are there are no there are no simple solutions, no magic bullets. Um, and that we really have to grab the bull by the horns and accept that we're going to have to see some really quite radical changes. Um, I'm looking at the time here and we are now into our last few minutes. What I'd like to do is, um, so I think that those are sufficient questions for us. Um, I'd like to go around each, each of you in the panel and just ask you please for, you know, maybe just to take a minute to, um, give some reflections on the questions that have come in on the discussion and any key messages that you would like people to take away from this session. Um, so uh, Charlie, since you're sitting there, so do you mind if we start with you? Sure, um, I, I, I'd like to make two quick points if I could. One is that as a lifelong environmentalist, I've always lived in despair um, until very recently. And the, you know, the, the rise of popular environmental movements, which have you know, led to the creation of this bill, gives me hope in a way that I've never had any hope before. So I think this is a fantastically exciting thing. The other, I just also wanted to add a very quick point to what, um, to the question that Charles addressed about how we're going to get a Tory government to um, enact this legislation. Well, yes, of course, they, respond to their corporate lobbyists, but they also respond to voters. And we mustn't forget that conservative voters have just as much interest in this as non-conservative voters. You know, um, think what does the word conservation, conservative mean? It's about conserving. There is no bigger conservative value than trying to maintain a life, a, a world in which our children can grow up. And you know, I live in West Norfolk, which is one of the most vulnerable places, not just in Britain, but to the, in the world, to sea level rise. And, you know, it's not the case that, that when the sea level rises, it's going to skirt around Tory voters' houses and, you know, just flood, um, you know, Labour voters' houses or Green Party voters' houses. We are, um, you know, we're not all in the same boat, but we are all in the same storm. Yeah. And your know, conservative voters have as much interest in getting out of this as the rest of us do. Thank you. Thank you. OK, very quickly, then moving on to Caroline, some closing comments, remarks from you, please. Yeah, I, I mean, we've got a government that claims to be world leading, whether it's in responding to the coronavirus or having a world leading environment bill. And, and the truth is anything but. And the key combination that this bill brings is the scientific rigor of making sure that we address the whole problem, but also making sure that this is something that 
the government can be held to account uh, held to account against and and I think it's really critical both from our own economy's point of view because as Charlie said um, being first to address this puts us into a very um, advantageous position but also especially with the chairmanship of, of COP26, if we are seen to lead the way and to take full responsibility for our emissions, it makes it much more difficult for other governments around the world to refuse to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Um, last couple of minutes. Yuri, very, very quickly, could you summarise your, your thoughts, reflections in 30 seconds, please? Yeah, I think easiest to say is that the, the science is clear. The science also shows that there are clear solutions uh, to, to address this, uh, this really huge challenge. Um, and uh, the science continues also to explore further, uh, further ways of doing things better. So it's also not, um, it's, you can also rely on scientists to continue to, to help uh, over the next years and decades because it won't be finished uh, in 10 years. Uh, to continue to provide evidence and to also provide and look for solutions that can uh, that can help. Thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. We absolutely must trust the scientists, continue to trust the scientists. Charles, um, final comments from you, please. Yeah, very quickly. Um, as I think I said earlier, this campaign is about hope. It's about putting solutions into place. It's about holding government and opposition parties to account. I mean, in 2019, just a year ago, all our MPs were standing up in Parliament, passing an emergency climate resolution and saying, we must act, we must act. Since then, it's been all talk and virtually no trousers. This campaign's about a participative democracy, a movement that will build up, already building up across the whole country to make sure that the right thing is done, the economically prosperous thing is done, and that we fulfill our international obligations to do our bit. So it's up to everyone out there to take that responsibility as citizens, work together, join hands, and we will win. Thank you, Charles. Um, and I particularly like your reference to hope. Hope in some circles has become a bit of a dirty word. I don't think it's a dirty word at all. I think hope is about having courage. It's about having courage to live with these difficulties, to live through these difficulties in the present moment. OK, thank you so much, everyone. Um, so um, final word for me, I'm Alison Green. I just want to thank the panel for joining us. So that's Charles, Caroline, Yuri and Charlie. Thanks to our hardworking tech team for bringing you this, uh, this, this current Ask a Scientist Live. Thanks to everyone for watching. Um, we're now going to display some information about XR scientists on a slide, and we can show you where you can find out more about the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill. Please support it. Please tell all of your neighbours about it. Do not be put off. Do not let them back you back. Um, we need this bill. We need change. Thank you. Thanks for joining us and see you again soon.